Hello, everybody. Welcome to Short Film Saturdays. I am Mika Cooper Edwards, founder and CEO at Soleil Space, and really excited because we have another Third Horizon, Soleil Space, and Caribbean Beach Short Film Saturday today with two really excellent films and really cool filmmakers. I think that's the best way to describe both of you guys um, and the stories that you tell. Um, so you're in for a treat today. And so to get things kicked off, for those of you who don't know about Soleil, our mission, we're, we're, and TV, really we're a media company we um, based in Brooklyn, New York. And our mission is to achieve a more equitable and representative global film and TV landscape. Our focus is on the global diasporas of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean and the Middle East, with the goals of elevating untold stories from these cultures, forming closer transcultural community bonds, and providing opportunities and resources for our creator community to produce premium world-class content. We specialize in film, TV, and editorial media, and we aim to lift up these underrepresented voices from regions that we think are not well seen, or authentically represented in the global mainstream media. And we think there's no better way to do this than short films because shorts are the most purest and artistic form of expression for filmmakers who don't have you know, the big budgets of Hollywood. And so it often executed with, within really strict boundaries and you get really the best quality storytelling. And today is gonna be no exception. Um, so buckle up. And since launching Short Film Saturdays in late summer of 2021, we've featured 63 films from 51 filmmakers in 24 countries to date. So we're really excited um, that that count keeps going up and the number of countries that you get to see every Saturday keeps going up. So let me introduce my co-host, Alicia Cristiani from Third Horizon. Um, Alicia, you wanna tell everybody about Third Horizon Film Festival and Studio Nancy? Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Cristiani. I am the Associate Director of Community Engagement for Third Horizon. Uh, Third Horizon is an award women film collective. We're dedicated to developing, producing, exhibiting, exhibiting, and distributing film and other art forms that give voice to stories of the Caribbean, the diaspora, and other marginalized and underrepresented spaces in the global South. Our films have been screened at, screened at festivals such as Sundance, Black Star, Berlinale, and TIFF. And in addition to producing our own work, we stage the annual Third Horizon Film Festival in Miami, which explores the exciting new wave of cinema and creativity emerging from our fellow filmmakers across the Caribbean and its diaspora. And as you mentioned, Mika, we also have Studio Anansi.tv, which is our answer to the online uh, streaming services that feature uh, Caribbean filmmakers emerging and established in their work so that you can easily watch what you, you know, access the films from home. Awesome. And third but not least, um, we want to say that, you know, we're really happy that we have an editorial partner on all of our Caribbean short film Saturdays, all our Caribbean themed short film Saturdays, um, Caribbean Beat. And Caribbean Beat is a partner um, for this event. It's one of the most esteemed longstanding publications um, in the Caribbean. And it was published by MEP Limited since 1992. And it happens to also be the in-flight magazine of Caribbean Airlines, but it's a real staple of Caribbean culture um, and one of the diaspora's leading culture and travel magazines. So I'm going to introduce now the filmmakers um, from Trinidad and Jamaica, Ian Harnerine and Nyan Salter. Ian was born in Toronto to Trinidadian parents. He studied physics and astronomy at York University, researching high energy physics with professors Badra and Minari. Ian earned a master's in nuclear physics at the University of Illinois and an MFA from NYU's graduate film school where he now teaches in both the film school and the physics department. Ian is a member of the National Board of Review and the Academy of Canadian Cinema and TV. His films include work for Ted Med and Sesame Street for which he has been nominated for an Emmy. His short film, Doubles with Sly Pepper, executive produced by Spike Lee, is what you'll see today and won the Toronto International Film Festival and the Canadian Academy Award. 
Connor Reiner's co-writing Time Traveler with Spike Lee, an adaptation of David Charian Lee's novel Sukuya, and a feature adaptation of Doubles with Sly Pepper. He was selected by Filmmaker Magazine as one of the 25 new faces of independent film and profiled in the New York Times. Ian, welcome, and please give a quick intro to your film before I introduce Niall. Yeah, thanks for having me, and thanks for giving the, uh, the space to all of us, you know, week after week. Um, this film is a, it's a really personal film to me, and I hope you all enjoy it. We made it in Trinidad, um, you know, a couple of years ago, many years ago, and uh, I think there's something that people react to it. It's a really, I think it's a really good father-son story, and I'm hoping the audience feels something when they're watching it. Thank you. All right, and now to introduce our second filmmaker, Niall Salter, a Jamaican director, cinematographer, photographer, and founding member of New Caribbean Cinema. His, he has written, shot, and directed various short films, short docs, fashion films, and commercial projects, which have been screened at gallery shows and film festivals in the US, Europe, the Caribbean, and Africa. He's currently working on his first feature film script, and his film that you will see today is called Fever Dream. So welcome, Niall, and tell the audience a sneak peek, no spoilers, of Fever Dream. Um, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Yes, uh, we shot Fever Dream in 2017. Um, it's a story that examines a character sort of living on the margins of society, um, which I'm always drawn to. And, you know, had a great time making it, and hopefully you guys feel what I'm trying to um, get across, you know, in terms of examining this character and the environment that he lives in, um, definitely a side of Jamaica and Kingston that is not seen very often. So yeah, I won't say too much, but thanks for having me and I hope you enjoy it. All right, so the way this is gonna work guys is we are going to show each film one after the other. So you'll get to, to, to see both of them um, first fever dream will start and then that will be followed with doubles with Sly Pepper. And then we will have a QA. and a We'll come back here for Q&A with Ian and Niall after the show. So you're in for a treat. Thanks again for being here and we're excited to talk about these two films. So enjoy the show. All right, so we're back. We could tell that you guys really enjoyed those two films as we knew you would. Um, and if you're just joining us, this is Short Film Saturdays with Soleil Space, The Horizon and Caribbean Beat. It's our Caribbean theme Short Film Saturday edition that we do every couple of months. And you just watch Fever Dream and uh, Doubles with Slight Pepper, Fever Dream by Niall Salter and Doubles with Slight Pepper by Ian Hanarine, um, Jamaican film and a Trinidadian, Canadian, very diasporic film, which we'll dig into, Ian. I'm excited to get your, your thoughts on, on that and the inspiration behind that. But we're going to start with Fever Dream, which is the first film that you would have watched. Um, so Niall, you're up first. And okay, so the first thing, um, especially as a Trinidadian myself, um, the scrap iron dealerships is a whole thing, right? Um, and it kind of boils up from time to time into the politics, into the, you know, into the societal aspects of it. Um, but very curious to know what fascinated you about this world um, enough to make a film through the eyes of a scrap iron dealer. Um, where did that inspiration come from? Okay, so basically, um... The main inspiration came from the fact that I had a friend who was basically his father owned a scrap metal plant and he had a high up job in the plant and he was doing really well. Um, and we would just reason about it, just just the situations down, you know, in the areas where you collect scrap metal is kind of fascinating. There was always a lot of lore, a lot of drama, you know, between the people collecting and that type of thing. Um, but he was basically part of a business that was doing really well and he was quite affluent. Um, so I, I just found it interesting to talk to him about that end of the spectrum. And then basically filming various projects all over Kingston, you know, it's like you're in a lot of communities where you're just reasoning with the people in the community. 
Um, and I remember right after I had seen that friend and we we're having this conversation about just the in and outs of the scrap metal business, I met a, a brethren in the inner city who actually collected the scrap metal. Um, and he was talking to me about stuff, you know? So I just found it interesting because within the space of a couple of days, I had spoken to people at both ends of that spectrum. Um, so I, I was kind of fascinated with just the world, you know what I mean, of, of scrap metal collecting. In addition to that, the area that you see in the film, which is a Riverton City landfill, which is, you know, Kingston's landfill, um, is an area where scrap metal collection happens a lot. Of course, it's the dump. So all of Kingston's waste goes there. Um, and it's, you know, quite a crazy place. So I started, you know, so with the scrap metal and then with Riverton, which is a place I was always fascinated by, I kind of figured, okay, well, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting world here. Um, and of course, you know, character wise, I'd want to follow somebody who is sort of at the lower end, you know, the, the, the man who's striving every day to try and collect stuff. So that's really what made me, you know, spark the first idea to sort of visit this world, um, you know, as the initial idea. Okay, so are there many different landfills like that in Kingston, or is this is this the biggest one? Is this the only one? Um, yeah, right. yeah. This is like this is the one. This is the one, right? Okay. So this is the big main one. Um, and another thing that's important to mention as well is something else that fascinated me about Riverton is that which you will see in the short film, which you've seen. There's fires there like once a month that are very mysterious. People can't, can't really explain how these fires happen. Mm. And you know, they seem to happen, like I said, at least once a month, they choke the whole city. You can imagine noxious fumes. You see it from all over the city and it's a real nuisance and you know, huge health ha hazard. So even the news clipping that you saw was an actual news clip report from one of the many fires. So I also found that really fascinating. Um, so all of these things put together is, is you know, sort of what made me want to really delve into the world and, and sort of, you know, examine it a bit more. Um, so, so yeah, but yeah, Riverton is the main landfill and, you know, it's very famous. Actually, funnily enough, they just talked about closing it very recently. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, you know, to everything. I don't really know how that going to go. That's just in the news recently. I need to look into that. Um, but yeah, it's been there forever and it's kind of a legendary place. A lot of old criminal shootouts from the eighties, you know, classic Jamaican stories have happened in the Riverton okay. city landfill. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's madness. Okay, okay. I have to ask this really quick and then I'll let Alicia jump in here. Um, but that shot with the pig. Yeah. That was real? Yeah, man, that's real. That's real. So you can imagine the environment is... <laughs> Ian is <laughs> laughing because, <laughs> yeah, I was like, did he put a pig or like... Did, no, man, no, man, no, man, no, man. Well, you see, this is the magic of going into an area that is a living, breathing sort of, <laughs> you know what I mean? world on its own mm -hmm. um so basically you know i knew that i wanted to shoot which i i'll probably get into more but i knew i had to actually go there to film you can't replicate that you know you don't want to you know what i mean so me and my crew i told them crew cast is like listen we're going into the trenches you guys just have to work with me um because i can't i'm not trying to go nowhere and set up no fake looking dump or not we can't do it we have to right, go into right. the trench so basically it was all real you know his house was a, a guy who lived there and we just beg him you know, a couple of hours, we want to shoot your house. The pigs now, they're all around because of the general squalor of the place. They sort of thrive in that environment. So a lot of the man them who are scrap metal collectors, they will actually have these pigs. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're doing all right. You know, it's them a mud bait every day and that is just their existence. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so how we got that shot was, you know, of course, there was a section of time where I said, listen, I just want to get cutaways. You, you swing your camera left, right, and center, you're getting amazing visuals. So that was just something that we kept seeing while we were shooting another scene. And I was like, listen, I need, I need a great shot of this pig situation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we actually interrupted a shot or we delayed to kind of go with me and my DP to get that shot. So that's all. Well that's done. All. Yeah. yeah, I had to ask about that one. That was, yeah. a, we didn't plan that question. I was like, I, I just need to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, replicating that would have been quite some work. So give time. Exactly. For, like, right. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask if you, this is the first time I've seen your film, Nile, And I was, even before seeing it, I was taken with just the title, Fever Dream. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I know, and I, you know, did a little research, I have, you know, that medically, Fever Dream is. You know, like a really intense disturbing dream you have when you're sick 
And then, you know, people use it in as a phrase to describe something strange or negative um, or, you know, just doesn't quite seem real. Uh, mm -hmm. So how did you choose that as a title and what does it say, do you think, about what's happening to to to, to the man, to Henry in, in this in this film? What does it say about his dreams, about his reality? Why, what, what does fever dream mean? Yeah, so I mean, basically, you know, there's a few different points with the title. I mean, it's like, there's a, there's a side of it you could say is on, it, it sort of, it, it hits a couple boxes because it's on the nose in one way, right? Like heat, fire, dreaminess, whatever, right? Fever dream. So that's one thing. That's why I kind of, I felt it worked in, in one sense, but in a bigger sense, um, yeah, it's that sort of, of, of delirious state where you know you're trying to work out your life you're trying to figure out where you should be um you know this film and i even saw it in, in the comments it's, it's like there's a lot it's, it's it's a meditative piece you know there's a lot left up to interpretation sometimes i don't really love that phrase because i feel it can be a little bit indulgent but there's a lot that you can you know glean from what is sort of being said what he's going through was this his life before is it his future life is it his imagination mm -hmm. so i think all of those things together you see this person who is living on the margins of society um, in a really tough situation and he's clearly not content or comfortable with it and you see this get ratcheted up with obviously the situations around him so I felt like it was really appropriate for that state of delirium and dissatisfaction that one would feel um, in that sort of situation you know what I mean so that was really why I thought of that and also I'm very funny with titles I like one word or two word titles for me so literally I go a little deep there but that's just something aesthetically that I really love I like how the, how, the, how the phrase looks on screen. I like how it sounds. So I just felt like, yeah, this, um, you know, this, this kind of made sense for, for the subject matter, yeah. Yeah, and well, I think it was really um, on point because it just like very clearly and simply captured that notion of escaping fever of life, escaping like, you know, this nightmare basically and the dream is a is a is like a tool of survival is dreaming and you see him not just doing it at the beginning you see him doing it you know at the end where he kind of discovers this kind of oasis of a place uh, with yes. the woman and all of that so that was really cool um so there's a scene and kind of speaking of survival um there's a bigger theme I think uh that came to mind when I when I saw this scene which was really powerful in the film he's confronted with the police right so there's a fire that's happening he's trying to get to his stuff and the interaction with the police I think well you 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 tell us you know did that did that mean to symbolize like the bigger and broader dynamics between police government poorer communities because you know again in the Caribbean, we have a lot of government inertia, and then we have the police that they are the, the tools of the government in a lot of ways. Tell us about that scene, what the intention was, and how that relates to dynamics between these communities and authorities in Jamaica. Yeah, um, so basically, if you remember one line that policeman says, where he says, if you, know, if you go in there, it's more trouble for us, right? He's basically saying, listen, you can't go in because like, I, I personally don't really care what happens to you, me, but if you go in there and you did, that's more trouble for us. So that's essentially, you know, the place that, that he's coming from. It's a lack of empathy, lack of compassion, um, which of course is rife, as he said, you know, throughout the Caribbean, I would say generally with, you know, the police authorities dealing with people who, you know, are not living in a certain margin. Um, so, you know, in a certain bracket. So yeah, so it was it was you know important for me to show that in a small way because it's not really the, the main crux of the whole of the storyline, but it's it's there. So that was really important to show. And also in a practical level, like I said, these fires, I mean, you know, for me, um a fire can sort of happen in 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 any situation. It could be something really simple, somebody tip over a candle or whatever. But the fact that these fires happen really regularly in Riverton, they're not really explained. The government also never gives a great explanation. There's never like you know, an eye-opening article or something that comes to light that really explains what this is about, why these things happen. Meanwhile, you know, the people, especially the people living right around the in the inner community, just close to Riverton, so for the most, and, you know, the wider community in Kingston, it's never really addressed. So it was just like kind of, you know, zooming into that little moment of the struggle between the authority and the everyday man. 
which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, all around us and always happening. So that was really the, the, the thought pattern with, with that one. Yeah. And they don't do anything about it either. Right. So it feels like a cycle. And whenever yes. it kind of bubbles up, then they send yeah. the police to kind of, you know, yeah. clamp things down and then you go again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's very cyclical. And this is what I'm saying. There's just not much solution. These things happen over and over. And it's sort of like you almost felt, if, you know, just work with it. It's oh, another river on fire. You know, like, for example, the environmental authorities here, you know, those people championing um, our environmental rights. And, you know, in general, in Jamaica, I will say, too, we're, we're really not very. <laughs> this is a general statement. But, you know, when it comes to the environment, we sort of don't know what we have. We don't treat it very well. You know, you know, that whole story. Um, so it, it, it's, it's disheartening to know that there's this disconnect where, you know, the higher authorities don't even seem to care or really want to put that much energy into sorting these things out. I think recently would, be, would have become a bit better um, in the last few years, but it's always been a real sore point for me in the community. Um, I mean, in, in the society overall. So it was also sort of like shining a little light on that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, I wonder how much of uh, Henry, the main character's experience and not necessarily specifically as a scrap metal collector, but in the, the struggle to survive and find a way to, to make a way out of no way, does that mirror Jamaican society or the average Jamaican man and woman? You know, their circumstance in life um, and where they, where they sit economically or just trying to achieve the Jamaican dream from, mm. from starting from wherever they're starting from. Yeah, absolutely. It, it very much mirrors it. I mean, first of all, with the character of Henry, I also wanted to sort of journey with somebody who was, you know, a bit more sensitive. Um, and, you know, I, hopefully that, that comes across, even though he's solitary, he doesn't speak very much. Um, I wanted to make that energy transmit on screen where, you know, he's not like a bad man, right? right. I mean, that's a whole bigger issue as well, right? You know, with Jamaican society and with this cultural output and our reputation for stuff and, you know, relative to size, we're really a giant when it comes to that. So there's all these impressions out there of mm -hmm. what Jamaicans are like, what they say, their energy, you know, bombastic, that type of thing. So first of all, I wanted to, you know, follow a character who is a bit more quiet, a bit more sensitive, contemplative, which is also my general um, aesthetic, I guess you could say, with filmmaking. I like to explore these characters. So I wanted to follow somebody where there was that empathy. And these, obviously, that's most of Jamaican society. That's the truth. It's just a man trying to live his life and do the best for himself um, and finding himself being sort of knocked down at, at every chance. You know, you see his circumstances are already tough to begin with, with where he's living and his, his little house, him have a little thing. You know, he's collecting scrap metal to, to build up, to be able to like, you know, purchase a little house and that gets taken away from him. And then he's mistreated by the police. There's just no empathy. Um, so absolutely, I, you know, it's, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely connected. I mean, and I don't think this is anything <laughs> really specific to Jamaica. I think we could, we could, you know, look at the wider Caribbean and say this is probably the case in a lot of places. You know, people have to do more, um, fight more obstacles than they should. They get knocked down at a lot of, you know, many junctures where things should be facilitated. They're not. So yeah, it's, it's definitely um, an examination of the wider society in the Caribbean and that struggle to real, like, as you said, the Jamaican dream. I don't quite know what, I don't really know what the Jamaican dream is. <laughs> I know some elements of it, but I don't think it's one particular thing. But, you know, literally just being able to earn your bread, live good, enjoy the beautiful things around us. And, and you know, the place that we're blessed to live in, because that's another thing. Jamaica, it's, it's a beautiful island, a lot of tourists. You know, this is enough people's number one destination from all over the world. But of course, the reality of the people who born here in a certain socioeconomic kind of scenario, life is very different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it mirrors it for sure. Alicia, that's a really interesting um that that uh, and Niall, that thing about the Jamaican dream, because you always yeah. hear American dream. Yeah. Right? That, that's really interesting. I mean, that's a whole other conversation by itself because like we're so brainwashed about the American dream and even, even, even for people outside of America, it's like the American dream should be our dream too. But a lot of people in the Caribbean and in a lot of places, they don't want to leave where they're from. And we come from really beautiful places, right? Yeah. 
And we just want to have opportunity where we are from and be able to enjoy the beaches, the everything, like enjoy the quality of life that we know is our booth, right? And not have to go anywhere else. But sorry, I went on a tangent there because it just got me, you know, that's that's a chord that you hit there that I think is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, okay. Switching gears, now we'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, but switching gears to Ian, doubles of slight pepper. So Ian, I'm in the US. You made me want double so bad. I got hungry watching this thing twice today. <laughs> um, well, you're in Brooklyn, right? You, you're not too far. You're not too far. You get some doubles yeah, where you are. Well, well, but still, it's not the same. You know that, right? The doubles isn't the same. The flower isn't the same. It's not the same. Um, so yeah, first of all, for people who aren't familiar with doubles and just kind of the cultural significance and the topic of, of the film, um, sorry, the name of the film. Tell tell the audience what are doubles and what's the cultural significance. So doubles is you know I guess it's it's the street food in Trinidad. It's widely available you know everywhere. Probably like how hot dogs are in New York or you know whatever it is in you know changes from place to place. But it's essentially two round you know fried flatbreads and stuffed with um, curry chickpeas. And the special thing is like all the condiments you put on it, whether it's, you know, pepper sauce, cucumber, tamarind, all these other things is what really makes the doubles doubles. Um, you know, why I think it's interesting is, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons. Historically, it's, you know, it's primarily an, an innovation of the Indo-Trinidadian community, you know, that came that, uh, the descendants of the indentured servants that came from India to the Caribbean. Um, but it's also, you know, not anymore, but at the time it was like a very really uniquely Trinidadian food staple. It's something that's unique to the island that was developed there, that's really enjoyed, that's widely available. And that was an important thing to me was to hit on something that um, that's uniquely Trinidadian, but is also sort of a, um, a metaphor for these, you know, for this family that's, uh, that's going to be, you know, investigated in this film. I love this film because it seems to be a twist on the parable of the prodigal son. Mm. Um, so it's, instead of the, the child who returns, you know, with his tail between his legs, it's the father that returns, you know, looking for forgiveness. And, you know, in general, that's an interesting tale. But to me, as the daughter of Guyanese immigrants, that said, that has that's a powerful statement when you consider the dynamics, the traditional dyna power dynamics between a parent and child in the Caribbean. So, what do you what do you think? What are you trying to say about the father son dynamic, a Caribbean father son dynamic, where it's kind of switched now, and the father is no longer the one in power; he's coming to his family with his you know his hat in hand. You know, I'm always so I, I come from like a, a very large family. Um, you know, my father's side of the family has like, there's like 17, 16 brothers and sisters. So I've got like tons of aunts and uncles and like a, an, an army of cousins. This is like an enormous family. Um, and my mother's side is, you know, is, is, is big too. And, you know, sort of the, the history of the Caribbean. Some people, you know, some members of the family, you know, migrated abroad to the US, Canada, UK, um, you know, but some people, I don't wanna say stayed behind, but chose uh, or didn't have the opportunities or what have you to leave. Um, and I've always found that interesting, the people that are so-called left behind um, or chose not to go. And particularly within families, those structures, I think, create a lot of tension. Um, and to me, it was about that. It's somebody, it's about a father that sort of, you know, that made promises. And, you know, with this conversation that just sort of broke out about this, this Jamaican dream or the American dream, and that sort of this, uh, this trope that's carried forth in in a lot of you know conventional fil conventional films and stories that you hear and that are that are championed and I've always wondered about that's not the vast majority of people you know for every successful person that gets rich in the states or Canada or what have you there's the majority of people that are just working hard and that really haven't achieved what they think they would achieve or you know they left to go abroad to for you know streets paved in gold and that's just not the situation it's a lot of hard work 
Um, and whatever that success that you were thinking to get to, most people just don't don't achieve that for a whole you know number of reasons. And those are the things that fascinate me. Um, and so I was trying to test this this father son bond separated by this this migration and promises that were not kept. To me, those are fascinating stories of um, of those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not just that they go and they um, we because you know we belong to that, right? Like it's not just that you go and you work hard, but sometimes you actually have to stoop to conquer, right? Nobody knows that you will X, Y, Z, achieve a certain level of education, success, business, even in this case is entrepreneurship. They were successful doubles vendors. I know doubles vendors in Trinidad who have mansions, right? Yeah. And so they, they do, right? And so they were trying to, rep, he was trying to replicate that and was so ashamed because the people left behind expect that when you go, you're like off to the races and coming back without a story of success is such shame and failure um, to a lot of people. So you really captured that there. Um, Thank you. So kind of tapping into the um, diasporic aspect and specifically the, the um, indigenous aspect of it, of those ancestors that came as indentured servants from India, right? The film starts and ends with the main character saying he is 108, I don't know if I got the number right, but 108 generation Brahmin, which is an Indian caste, right? And it's the highest Indian caste. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he keeps repeating that that is a lie. And I think he really expands on that at the end. So talk about that, because there's a lot of heights in that, um, <laughs> you know, speaking to Indo-Trinidadian identity, the complexity of that. So explain that opening and closing statement. And at the end, you talk about, your, you know, this being a tribute to your father. Was that your ex father's experience in some way? Like, is that connected? Mm. Um, I guess, okay, so I'll... I'll I'll ask the first question. So that sort of the monologue where he talks about, you know, his what he what he believes his family history is is, you know, it's I guess it's my critique of Indo Trinidadian culture, or at least a, a portion of Indo Trinidadian culture, where um, you know, even to this day I'll always hear somebody saying, "Oh yeah, you know, my family was Brahmin back in whatever else," and it's this absurd system of, you know, colonization and a whole bunch of other things and um, and caste, you know. It, it's a system that it was it was kind of amazing when that system was sort of abolished in you know in in, in indentureship because everybody was kind of at the bottom. Lowest caste at that point. Right, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. and you know, there are there are exceptions, but for the most part, the people that came over, you know, weren't the highest castes. Um, there are exceptions, of course, but the majority of people that came were people that whose only option was to go on a boat for months and hopefully go to some place that they never heard about um, and work really hard. Like that was their best option um, to do that. And I think there's this false, this false idea that a lot of people have about their personal heritage in terms of where they came from. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, that still exists to, these, to this day. Uh, so like that's sort of my critique on, on that. But in terms of, I guess, the connection to my own father, um, you know, the story is a very personal story, but not in a sense that, you know, you might expect. I, actually, I read one of the, the the questions in the chat and the chat, people in the chat, you, like you really make the experience a lot of fun. It's a really good chat. <laughs> it's the chat, going in that chat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's real good. Um, but no, so my father, he was, um, he wasn't a doubles man, but he, you know, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you know, you know, many years ago. And, you know, he was in Toronto. I was going back and forth between New York and Toronto. I was in school. And if anyone knows about Alzheimer's, or if you've, you know, you've had someone with Alzheimer's in your family, you know, there's, there's no cure. There's no turning back. It's just a matter of like, how quickly are they going to decline? And so when I was going back and forth a lot, like the changes that were happening to him became very apparent to me. My mom, um, she was his primary caregiver. And I remember going back one time and just realizing or feeling that this, this wasn't my father anymore. He wasn't the man that raised me. 
And it's, it's that feeling that I'm trying to capture, what it's like to meet your father for the first time towards the end of their life. Mm -hmm. And it's that feeling that really started this, this film and what it is that I'm trying to, to capture or at least have the audience um, experience or feel for themselves as well. Wow, that puts a whole other level to it. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm, of course. I love that the film is centered around food. I find that to be very Caribbean. You know, we say and do things using food that we wouldn't say out of our mouths. We use it as a way to communicate our feelings and thoughts and 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 how we feel for one for one another. Particularly in a scene where he puts the honey in. I feel like there's a there's a thing in the air there. there there's a slight reconciliation or, or movement towards reconciliation there that no one will say, but the the, the sharing of the of the chana yeah. um, represents, and also when he's going into the operation. You know, you're not supposed to eat before you're about, you're about to get cut open, but let me show give you this little bit of love, um, just breaking off a, a piece of the uh, the doubles. So, how do you? What's your take on? Uh, Caribbean culture using food to speak when they to say something they can't or won't say yeah exactly you know that's that's I think it's you know it's a, it's a Caribbean culture thing but I also think like a really Trinidadian thing as well because you know unlike unlike Jamaica and you know now now touched upon it you know earlier when he was answering some questions there really isn't that much tourism in Trinidad whatsoever you know there's like small pockets but it doesn't really exist. And as a result, there's, re I, I don't know how to, there's not much going on in Trinidad except for amazing food and music, right? Obviously we're trying to change that with film and, you know, and Carnival and all that stuff. But for the most part, I think the culture is really centered around food and music. Mm -hmm. And even within my own family, like if you ever go to somebody's house, somebody's always cooking. There's like the, the community, congregates around food it's the there's a big food culture in trinidad if you've ever been and i think that's an important part that's not um i guess it's not stressed about or that's something perhaps we don't really talk about enough or understand and to me like the the doubles is like the it's the one thing that this family in the film is going to agree upon is the doubles itself and it's sort of just the thing that brings them together is exactly that and to me that's what i think food is um, within the culture, it's like a place that it's it's a venue, if you will, that allows people to congregate and come together finally. Mm -hmm. And again, everybody, it's the one thing that everybody can agree on. You know, in Trinidad, mm -hmm. some people may not like this music or that music or whatever, but everyone agrees doubles is great. Doesn't matter wherever you come from, you know, poor man, rich man, educated, doesn't matter. Everyone eats doubles. Everybody. And I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought up music. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and this is the last question for, for, for you, Ian, before we go back to questions for you both. Um, but you have Parang playing in the background while the Indian family is dealing with some very heavy realities. And then you have them dancing to Parang and Chutney at different parts of, of the film, right? So you and I being from Trinidad know what that is, right? But there are a lot of cultures that come together right there. So contextualize your music choices, both from a mood standpoint, but also the cultural symbols in there um, for those who aren't familiar with, again, with Trinidad culture. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great question. So um, the more Spanish music is, is called Parang. And I think the interesting thing about Parang is you only hear it around Christmas time. And so the film is set around Christmas in Trinidad. And, you know, one of the choices or one of the reasons behind that is, you know, because the, you know, the weather's pretty much the same in Trinidad aside from, you know, wet and dry seasons, it's, you know, rainy season. It's, to me, Christmas is so spectacular there because it really, it signifies the change of time or the passage of time. And it's the one time where, you know, spring cleaning doesn't exist, but around Christmas, people will get, you know, new curtains, new tablecloths, new everything, clean everything. And it's a really special time um, in the uh, in the end with really special foods like the, you know, fruitcake is only around then. Although now you can get fruitcake anytime you want, but, you know, primarily it's only around around Christmas. And this music, the the Spanish influenced music is, is Parang and 
it's really only played and celebrated around Christmas. And again, to me, it's a really uniquely Trinidadian thing. It's not an authentic thing. So that's like a, a reason why I um, I chose to use Parang because again, everyone sort of appreciates it on the island. Um, yeah. Indian, you know, African descendants, Spanish, everybody, even the new, you know, the new arrivals to Trinidad all sort of really love, love Parang music. And um, the, you know, the chutney music that's playing the, the Baba and Kanchan tracks that's there, you know, those are, to me, like those, that's the music that I grew up on, um, is chutney music in the kitchen, particularly when people are cooking. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be some sort of, some music that's playing. Um, and so it was, it was primarily about that. What I will say about some of the, the other music though, with the, the score in particular, if people pay attention to that, is it was really hard to do. And the pairing music was really hard to make choices on that because yeah. pairing, because it's around Christmas time, it's a very happy music. It sounds really upbeat all the time and the tones that are used. And it's very, because the film, I can't, it's not the happiest film um, and the mood is not, is not really upbeat. It was really hard to find music and to compose music uh, for, you know, for the film because inherently Trinidadian music is really upbeat and really and really happy. So it was really difficult to find those tones um, mm -hmm. within the music. But it did draw a really good contrast though, because oh. while they had these dark issues to deal with, the rest of the country is singing parang and drinking and eating and, you know, right? And Christmas could be a really sad time for some people. And I'll put a plug in here um, now because at university, all the Jamaicans used to tell the Trinis, oh, y'all only listen to happy, happy music. <laughs> <laughs> they used to tell us that all the time. We used to be like, so what's wrong with happy music? Like, you know, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but that was a thing. So yeah, and you, you brought back that memory for me there. Um, all right, so we're gonna open up a couple questions to you both. And in the meantime, we're gonna have audience, um, audience members, we see you all chatting a lot. We know there are questions that came along the way, um, but start putting them in, um, repeat them because they could have gotten buried. And if you've been holding on to one, start putting your questions in. Um, but for both of you, and you could you know, jump in whenever you feel comfortable, how do you feel your respective upbringings inform the stories that you not just have told, but intend to tell through film? Mm. Okay. Uh, an interesting one um yeah so me personally I'll just just jump into it like I I grew up in the country um in Jamaica in Negril so my parents basically are from Kingston originally but they moved to Negril in Westmoreland which is the other end of the island um in the late 60s and had a little tribe of us um on some hippie vibes you know so I basically grew up as full on country youth, right? People might assume that I come from Kingston, you know what I mean? And I grew up here, but like, no, I, I and that, inf that definitely informed, you know, my personality, um, you know, growing up in the country. And, and then also another interesting thing was, um, you know, in the grill, there's a lot of sort of one Jamaican parent, one foreign parent that lives there. A lot of my friends growing up were just like, you know, Jamaican dad, French mom, that type of thing. I think what that did, is it sort of planted a seed of interest in me for the wider world, for how other people live, for cultures, you know, visually, um, you know, that, that being visually represented, I was always drawn to it. And it really interested me in seeing the power of it, um, of cinema. So that was something. Another thing is like going to the shop in the country, seeing everybody really, you know, like super into whatever was on the screen. Um, which is like kung fu movies seeing the influence and power of that so it's like you go to the shop and it's like you know the old man that's always just riding in bicycle by himself the two little kids you know what i mean maybe the tour, the one tourist passing through the town and everyone would just be so captivated by what was on the screen so i, I always looked at that like you know the power of that is quite amazing and it's something that also the fact that you you know everyone was observing it in silence right it was a moment of silence everybody's having their own particular um, experience and processing this sort of information in their own way, I found that to be very powerful. You know, you're almost being the most affected when you're not saying anything, you're just observing. So in a more general sense, that's what it really interested, you know, me in 
when it came to film. Um, but also, as I said, I, just growing up in that interesting sort of middle ground, where it's almost like if you were to maybe meet me as a person living in Kingston now, you might think I born and grow here. But if you really got to know me, you would sort of, I, I, I think you would see the elements of my personality and my interest that would almost tell you that I didn't born and grow in Kingston, especially in like no society type of thing, if you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I think that's informed, you know, my artistic leanings, I guess you could say, because also my family, everyone has a bit of that um, in different ways. I have, you know, eight siblings um, and everyone has a little touch of that as well. So, you know, what, when it comes to expressing yourself artistically. So yeah, basically the stories I want to tell in a different way are about characters that are lesser explored, I guess you could say, overall. Um, I've always been drawn to that, even in, in watching you know, foreign films, the type of stuff I consume, I'm just drawn to that. I find it more interesting. And some I've always said in Jamaica, like I say, and I touched on it before, is because of our you know, great, the big cultural output and how are Jamaicans, what do we put out there? Who are we, you know, we're loud, we're proud, et cetera, et cetera, um, which I definitely am as well. But I also feel like, it's really interesting to observe people in their quieter moments, their day-to-day -day, um, situations that they may not talk about, but this, but things that everybody is going through, you know what I mean? The fabric of life. So yeah, my upbringing, I think between these two worlds, like the country and the, and the Kingston life really informed that for me. Like something I always say, for example, is when I moved to Kingston to finish high school, the level of Patois that I was speaking was like, like a next language, you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? You, you know how it go, like in Jamaica, there's <laughs> levels to the patois. So yes. there's like more recognizable in between type of thing where it's like, oh yeah, if you speak, you know, everybody can understand you, but you go deeper into the country, it can get quite serious. It's a and completely was, different yeah. language. You don't understand anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, is this a different English that I didn't learn? Yeah, <laughs> trust me. So when I moved to Kingston, I moved to Kingston to finish high school. So it's almost like coming from, you know, country to town. The level I was talking, trust me, it's like I, I laugh about it anytime, I, you know, people remind me like, yo, you remember when you moved to Kingston, how you did that talk? Um, <laughs> so that's definitely formed, you know, my personality. And as a result, has, um, you know, put my, my the, the things I want to show, the stories I want to delve into, it sort of is in that same realm. People on the margins, I guess you could say, lesser mm -hmm. represented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Ian? I, I, I guess for me, what, what I can say is that you know, every single film that I've made um, comes from a very personal place. It started off with, you know, something that I've experienced personally or a story that was told to me by, you know, family or friends or something like that. So every, like most of the, you know, all of my family is West Indian. And so that's where my, where my stories are coming from. You know, I, I grew up like, you know, you mentioned in the bio, it's like I grew up in, in Toronto and, you know, growing up, you look on, you look at movies, you look at TV, there's nobody that looked like me or like anybody on this zoom right now and i always thought i'd try to do something about that if i was given the opportunity and there came a point in my life where it was um, it was frustrating it was like okay well no one's doing it if i get the chance i'm going to do it let's let's try to let's make a go with this and try to tell stories in an, in an authentic way that means something to me and i think you can do that nowadays because i guess like you know although i you know you mentioned i didn't grow up in trinidad but because there's such a strong community, Caribbean community, West Indian community in Toronto and New York and Florida, whatever, I feel like you can grow up in those places and still become really aware of, of the culture, of your culture, whether it's food or music. I mean, Kari Banner just passed, you know, in West Indian Day Parade, like those are big events mm -hmm. across the entire diaspora that, that bring people together. And even just, just, I'm just thinking about it food wise and what Mal was talking about that how you know, Jamaica is, you know, I don't, I can't remember the word you use now, but like overrepresented in terms of culture and, um, you know, production and, and awareness compared to Jamaica size. And it's true. Like the Caribbean is right now, I think having a moment in all these places, or at least, you know, the people that, um, the community is like, is like not taking it anymore and they're standing up and mm -hmm. they're saying, these are the things that we want to do these are the foods we're going to eat. This is the music we're going to listen to. And people are, come, are are catching on. I mean, you know, in Toronto now it's crazy. Like you can, patties everywhere, Jamaican patties everywhere. Like most convenience stores, you can go into a, and get a patty anytime you want. It's amazing. 
you know, doubles are having like a, a moment too all over the place. It's um, it's incredible to watch and it's really different from, you know, during the time when I grew up. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 incredible to see how, you know, how the culture from these really small islands is um is having a dent in society. Um, yeah. and it's 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 a great thing to see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Marshall just sold out Parkley Center. Parkley Center, yeah, exactly. I have to plug that one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's amazing. Yeah, you know how many artists can sell out that place? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. That's, again, another, that's a whole other conversation. All right, I'm going to skip to Q&A um, mm-hmm. with the audience because they're submitting some questions. Um, and then we have one last question for you guys after to close, but we have a few coming in here. All right, so this question is for Ian. Um do you feel a disconnect with your culture living in Canada? Well, you kind of just answered that, but I think it'll be interesting to, to, to you know, do you ever feel a, a disconnect or what you're hinting to is that has that changed actually? Um, you know, is there a Caribbean community there? And, you know, of course this person wouldn't be familiar, but, you know, give give a little bit more on on how you feel individually and your connection as someone who grew, who lived in Canada for so long? Yeah, I think my perspective might be a little bit more um, nuanced in in these ideas of belonging and where home is. What I'll say is that you can't you can't ever really feel as if you belong in Canada because, for the most part, you don't look like. People, of course, like in you know small communities, you, you can blend in. But for the most part, if people ask you, they never ask you where. They always ask you where you're from. You're assumed not to be, to be from there, whatever that means. When we say, "Where are you from?" You don't look like you're from here, or "Where are you really from?" is like is another question. If you say, "Oh, I was born in Canada. I was born in Toronto," that's not acceptable. They want to know more. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, when I go, you know, when I go back to Trinidad. You know, surrounded by people that you know that that do look like me, I'm very quickly outed as somebody that's not from there because perhaps of the clothes the clothes that I dress, the way that I speak, um, it's very clear to people that I'm not actually that I'm not from there, and so I don't have a sense of belonging in in either mm-hmm. one of these places. I can't say that I ever feel a, like I, I felt comfortable in Trinidad. I can't really say I felt really comfortable in. In Toronto or New York or whatever the situation is, um, it's a really to me it's a really complicated uh, feeling that I, I I'm I know I'm not alone because there's a lot of other first generation people that uh, that feel the same way of not really belonging somewhere. Um, and I'm sorry I, for, I forgot the second part of the question. Oh no, I think well they were asking if there's a Caribbean community there, but I think you you answered that because you talked about how they're small enclaves, but the bigger Canadian society, you don't look like them, right? Correct? Right, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. All right, and this one is for Niall. Um, the intro was beautifully shot. Was it difficult to shoot those scenes, and why did you choose the black and white medium to make that work? Um, no, it wasn't. No, I can't say it was difficult to shoot, especially considering what else we got into. You know what I mean? That was the one day where like an AC was blowing through the house, give thanks because, you know, that's a, even that in itself is a blessing. Um, <laughs> so no, no, it wasn't difficult to shoot. We just floated through the house. Um, you know, choosing to shoot in black and white, I very much like black and white um, in photography and film. I just, I just like, I like that, you know, more simple contrast, I guess. And I wanted to sort of, I knew I wanted to have a transition from black and white to color feel like it made sense to start with it. And it also sort of puts you in the world of this dreamy state, right? You're asking questions immediately. Um, as well as the sort of jazz track, uh, I wanted to evoke that kind of feeling as well. So it's, it's a whole heap of things why, why I did that. Um, and I find that the harsh reality that we go into, and even somebody had said it in the comments while the film was, was playing, they liked the transition. Um, I wanted to, that's what I wanted to get across. I wanted the audience to feel that same thing. So an elegant look, an elegant feeling with the track. As you can see, you know, both characters are dressed really nice. Um, and they sort of look like they look, they're dreaming. They're just floating through. You're not quite sure where they're supposed to be. 
um, and what exactly is going on. So I wanted to sort of make that feeling, you know, come, come across to the audience at the very beginning. So that's right. And I like that there was no interaction between them. Yes. That, you know, so it, it was almost like they were both distant from each other. And, they, you know, there was some kind of longing. There was a dream within a dream almost, um, yes. which was really cool. Um, exactly. All right. So this is for you both from Joy. What is what are the miscon what are the misconceptions about your community that people think is true? Can you tell that one first? <laughs> I left to think. Um, Even you're not in modern now, so you could go ahead. You're like, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's so many, right? There's so many. I think you know one of the biggest misconceptions is is that you know I'm, that we're from India. Um, you know, the most common question that I, that's always asked if, you know, whenever I screen the film, you know, publicly is where in India did you shoot this film? And you're able to use that as like a point to sort of what we've done here is, you know, tell the story of the Caribbean, which is one of colonization and one of like a, you know, a whole bunch of cultures coming together for uh, basically to, to cut sugar cane and, and, and cocoa and coffee. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's one of the biggest misconceptions about that is that I, I, you know, I feel like a lot of people think that, you know, we're all from India. Um, and it's interesting because there is, you know, there, there's this, there's been a growing movement in Trinidad to, you know, to go back to, uh, to sort of reject this colonization and go back to, you know, not go back to India, but go your back roots. to some of those traditions right. yeah to go back to your roots yeah exactly thank you that's a much easier way of saying what i was what i was going to say um yeah exactly that and that adds a whole other complexity to it because you know for the most part we've all lost our language we've again for a large part we've lost religion um and it's interesting how people are going back to that and what that what that means some in some cases it never left but in some cases you know there's a lot of conversion that happened to christianity um, and to other religions, and a lot of people going back, which I think is fascinating. Um, but that in itself is interesting. Like the Indo-Caribbean take on Hinduism is very different than contemporary Hinduism in India. Um, and so that's there's a lot of complexities involved in um, in these nuances of the culture. But it's to me that's the biggest misconception is our our ties to India itself. Yeah. Um... Okay, so for me, I guess there's a there's a few things one could say about this. Um, you know, as somebody who travels quite a bit and you know works uh, quite far from Jamaica, um, especially the last couple of years, I've been spending time in the Middle East, so I have these conversations quite often about what people think Jamaica is fully. Um, so there's many things. You know, one of the, one of them, as simple as it sounds, people I hear a lot. Oh, you don't look Jamaican. That's one. So the multicultural vibes is sort of lost on a lot of people. And I think this, you know, this, this can sort of encapsulate most of the Caribbean as well. You know, I think there's a very rigid idea of where is where and what is what and what people look like. So that's definitely one thing, you know, Jamaica is very much multi multicultural society. Um, as Trinidad is, I mean, I know, of course, the, the population breakdown is, is very different in Trinidad, in Jamaica but it's definitely a multicultural society. Um, that's one big misconception. People have a very specific idea. Okay, everybody smoke weed, everybody are Rasta, you know? Um, I mean, I've spoken to people who think that, you know, we don't have no infrastructure. I mean, it's quite, it's quite something. And the reason I also talk about this is because I'd like to talk about the misconceptions that don't just cover American misconceptions, right? Because, you know, America is one place, but the entire world has a particular idea. And I, I'm, it's really interesting to talk to people from Pakistan, for example, and to see what they might have thought. Well, I one thing, when I talk to people from Pakistan, they know the cricket man them. They don't know, <laughs> they know Chris Gale. Some of them don't even know you say it bold. That's always really interesting right. to me as well. They don't even know Bob, but they know Chris Gale. Um, so that's really, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's one interesting thing. And as well, you know, I, I it would be, it would be, um, you know, it'd be a bad form of me to not point out the fact that Jamaica obviously is not all crime and violence, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people overseas that have this idea, oh, Jamaica is dangerous. They think this is just across the board, Jamaica is dangerous. 
I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, it's, it, it's not quite crazy here at times. Um, that's just the reality. I'm never going to act like that's not the case. But obviously, you know, the vast majority of society is, you know, living fine, doing well. I mean, obviously, with all of the socioeconomic struggles and that whole laundry list of things that we can delve into. But, you know, in general, that, that's, that's something that I have to point out. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, man, I want to go to Jamaica, but I hear it's just crazy. This is violence. It's bad. It's whatever, whatever. Clearly, as simplistic as it sounds, this is not the reality across all, you know, four corners mm -hmm. of the island. So as simple as that is, I just have to say that because it's something I've had to say quite a few times. Those are good ones. Those are, you know? Yeah, those are really, really good ones. There's yeah. a, um, a quote by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I don't know if you guys know who she is, a Nigerian um, author. Look her up. She's a good one. Um, but she has a quote called The Danger of the Single Story. Well, it's actually a TED Talk. Um, mm. The Danger of the Single Story, right? When you have so few stories, that's all people see, that's all they know, right? And so that's why the importance of you guys telling all these nuanced stories and showing a different face and side. Like Ian, you are our first Indo-Caribbean filmmaker, Indo-Trinidadian, sorry, filmmaker to, to, that we've shown a film from Short Film Saturday. Like, you know, that's why we were so excited about that, right? So the more that we could do around our stories, the, the more stories we could tell, the more people will see us in, all our colors, not just one. So. So what are you guys up to next? What is, what are you working on now? What do, can we look forward to seeing from you coming up? Share, share. Yeah. And how could people uh, follow you? So give, give everybody a handles and to keep up with you. So I, um, I, I'm, I got off of Facebook, but um, on Instagram, it's just my last name at at Harnerine. Um, and I get, yeah, I'm, I'm in post-production actually on the feature film adaptation of this, uh, of the short film that you all just watched. Um, we're literally editing it right now and hopefully we'll get it out and, you know, out there in the world next year, hopefully. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Exciting. It is exciting. It was just yeah. like, uh, an enormous <laughs> amount of work. So like just shooting, sh shooting during COVID and that adds like a whole other level of, uh, of complexity to, you know, to making films nowadays is that, but we got it done and, um, and it's, it's turning out really good. The performances are, are just, are just incredible. It's, I'm so, it's, it's such a great feeling. And I'm, I feel so like energized every time, you know, I look at the film where it's at now when we're, you know, when we're in the edit room, because there's some really special things that happen in the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wicked. That's a great place to be. I just have to say, filmmaker to filmmaker, congrats on. I, I can, I can, I, I can feel that energy. I know exactly what how that feels, man. When it's like, yo, you, you got everything you need. Now it's just crafting it. And even as stressful as it is, at least, it's in a room with a screen. And you know, so you chip away, you can get there. So, congrats on that, man. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, for me, you know, right now, doing various, you know, commercial sort of projects. Like I said, I've been traveling a lot um, to the Middle East, like twice a year. I spend some time there working on commercial projects, which is great. So that's like on that side of things. Very next, uh, there's a short film that we're hoping to shoot at the end of this year, very beginning of next year called Someone. Um, there's some Third Horizon links there. That should be really <laughs> good story. It should be really great. We're sort of like locking up the concept fully now, you know, like a script rewrites, but very cool co-production. Um, so that should be really interesting. And as the big, the big, big project, my first feature film, um, Escape the Last Man Peak. So this is a classic Jamaican novel. Um, I would say, you know, in the Caribbean overall, you know, I know it's read in, in other schools as well. Um, you know, throughout the Caribbean. So it's sort of a literary treasure. It's gonna be my uh, feature film debut. Um, so right now, yeah, so, so, so we're getting there. You know, we're just going through the, the, the processes that you go through building up, um, you know, to be able to, to shoot. So, you know, things like getting the script, fine tuning, making sure that's all perfect. You know, I'd go like feature film is quite a journey to just get all the elements together, especially when you, you need to tell the story in a certain way and really bring it to life in a way that the story deserves, you know what I mean? So this gem of, um, of a book. So we're dealing with that now. So step-by-step step, we're getting there. Um, 
so that's that's going on as well so prep is going on for that so yeah that's what's up guys this is so exciting like i wish i could fast forward just to see these films tomorrow but congrats this is really this is i really... wish you could i wish i could fast forward to the film as well. i know i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure but that time passes in no time right i mean it's you know it's a process but you know that's gonna go by lightning speed so congrats already in advance is it sounds <laughs> they both sound really awesome all of them so let me apologize to the audience. I know there were a lot of other questions while we we're running long on time. So that's why we had to just select a few and hopefully um, you guys enjoyed the answers. But this was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Niall. Thank you so much, Ian. Alicia, as always, you're like the best host, co-host ever. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. And, uh, you know, all of the audience conversation was really just as entertaining as the films. I, li I like to say that. Um, do you guys want to give any parting words before we close? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I didn't set a social. Well, I guess it's, it's written in the, in the YouTube chat. Um, my Instagram is Nihilus1X, N-I-L-U-S-1-X. That's my Instagram. I'm on Twitter as well nilesalter.com my website for more works you can see all of the things um yeah that's pretty much oh and i also have to say i am a huge fan of trini food i didn't say this throughout i love doubles i'm like my reverence for trini food is very strong so big up on yourself i just just i just wanted to say like as a you know as a jamaican who's gone through that quite a few times the food amazing and the whole vibes and i, I think i also want to say Caribbean love and integration is something we should always promote and push and foster. So, you know, it's it's really nice to, to sort of have these conversations and thank you guys for facilitating it. Awesome. Yeah, thank, you know, thanks to you, you the, the company's Third Horizon, always, always pushing us out there. So thank you so much to both of you. Yes, it's great to have you guys. Alicia, any quick parting words before we... This was an amazing afternoon. Great films, great people, great conversation. Thank you guys for your time. I really enjoyed. Thank you for putting this together, Isha. Um, Yeah, this was a wonderful day. It's a way to spend the afternoon. All right. So guys, next short film Saturday will be on the 17th. Um, we're going to have a Middle Eastern filmmaker um, particularly award-winning Middle Eastern filmmaker. This will be in collaboration with our um, Middle Eastern editorial partner, Moving Image Middle East, and the filmmaker Susanna Mirgani has won, like, you know, been in top festivals, won a lot of awards, and we're showing two films from her, so it's going to be a really great time. Also, in case you're on our IG, we have, we're wrapping up uh, five giveaways that we're doing to celebrate five years of Soleil and one year of Short Film Saturdays. Um, so you could participate now if you go to our Instagram, soleil.space, to win an Airbnb experience. Um, so we're really excited about that. A ton of entries so far, and we're giving the last prize next week. So you could feel free to hop in there and visit our new website to follow all things Soleil Space and Short Film Saturdays, www.soilspace.com and like and subscribe to this YouTube channel if you enjoyed what you saw today. So thanks everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you.